Hey everybody, I wonder if you've ever stopped to consider what Yeshua really meant when he told us to be as wise as serpents. This is found in Matthew 10, 16. It says, Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Now, if you hang with me in this video, I think you're going to pick on some fascinating truth that we can learn from the serpent. Uh, in the garden, what appears to me to be a technique that both Yeshua and the serpent used when dealing with people, uh, specifically when discussing matters of the heart. Now, it's clear from this instruction that there is something that Yeshua wants us to learn from the serpent. Have you ever considered this interesting thought before? Now, in order to understand what Yeshua wants us to learn from the serpent, we got to go back to the beginning and take a look at the story in Genesis 3. Now let's look at Genesis 3.1. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, reading this through this time, I realized something that I've always missed. Uh, it's always been there, but I've never caught it. You know, I thought the serpent asked Eve if God said not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, but that's that's not at all what he said. In fact, what he asked was very tricky. Because of how he asked the question, it prompted Eve to give something other than a simple yes or no response. She couldn't say yes because Yahweh did not say that. And she didn't want to say no because, you know, what he said was kind of right, but Yahweh's instruction was more specific than that. And Eve wanted to clarify it. Now, here's the simple truth. Nobody likes to be ordered to do things. No one likes for you to roll up on them and say, hey, you shouldn't be doing that. Or, you know, the opposite. Uh, you need to be doing this when you're, you're not doing it. Uh, how often does that ever actually work on somebody, that you just drop it on somebody like that and they go along with what you say? Going around trying to make people answer your, you know, yes or no questions is a great way to box people in and a great way to turn people off. The enemy is smarter than this. If the enemy had simply said, did God say, don't eat from that tree? Then Eve could have simply said yes, and boom, end of story. But what he did was he got her into a conversation. You may remember Yeshua saying this in Matthew 5, 37. Look what he says. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Why would Yeshua say that? Well, let's go back to Genesis 3. I think this is why. Here we have Eve responding to the serpent in verse, let's go down a little bit, verse 3. So this is Eve speaking. Uh, but God said, you shall not eat of the tree, eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. Uh-oh, did God say that? Well, God said some of that. If we scroll up just a little bit to Genesis 2, 16 and 17, you can see, and the Lord God or Yahweh commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God did not say you can't touch it. Uh, was Eve even present to hear that instruction? No, what's crazy is after this instruction right here, if we jump down to the, the very next verse, it says, Then Yahweh said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. So Eve was created after the instruction was pronounced. So what does this mean? Well, it means we need to figure out where did Eve get her instruction from. Uh, I believe she heard it from her husband, Adam. Now, what's wrong with this? When man tells us, God said, you know, X, Y, Z, but we don't go back to the source to verify it, then we get in trouble. My buddy Aaron, uh, when we were discussing this at, uh, earlier this uh, past week for Tabernacles, he said this is probably the first recorded case of the game telephone. Because what you have is Eve said, Adam said, God said, and look how quickly the message has already been distorted. Now, tradition says that after the serpent heard the woman's response, he took a hold of one of the, the limbs on the tree and gave it a shake, and some fruit fell. You know, maybe it fell on the ground. Maybe it fell into Eve's open hands. You know, we don't really know. Uh, 
after seeing this happen, how do you think that Eve would have felt? She probably, uh, she probably thought, you know, in, in her mind, she believed that God said, don't touch it or you'll die. But here she sees the serpent touching it with no problem. So God must have lied. Why would God lie? Well, I believe the enemy being as crafty as he is, I think he predicted her thoughts and he supplied the answer to the unanswerable question. He said in Genesis 3, 5, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, imagine being in a court case. All right, you're trying to convict someone of doing something very wrong. What must you have in order to convince a jury that they did it? You've got to have a motive. If you don't have a motive, your case isn't going anywhere. Now, the enemy has supplied a motive for why God may have lied to her. Now, we don't know what happened here. We can only, we can only surmise, but I can think of two possibilities. Number one, Adam, who was present, acted like a Pharisee in this case, and he put a fence up around the trees because around the tree because that's what Pharisees do. Now, Yahweh said, don't eat the fruit. Adam said, don't touch the tree. He may have thought that by protecting his wife from touching the tree that he was, you know, going to be sure that she would never eat the fruit. Uh, you know what that's called? That's called religion. That's legalism. And it might even be lying. Uh, I think you can make that case. Let's go to uh, Deuteronomy 4, 1 through 2. And, and now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you and do them, that you may live and go in and take possession of the land that Yahweh, the God of your fathers, is giving you. You shall not add to the word that I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of Yahweh, your Elohim, that I command you. Okay? Now, another witness for the same thing is in Deuteronomy 12, 32. Everything that I command you, you shall be careful to do. You don't add to it, and you don't take from it. I actually saw a, a pretty good rabbinic quote, short and to the point, says, uh, he who adds subtracts. Think about that. By adding to what God said, whether Adam told his wife wrong, or scenario two, maybe Eve wasn't listening and she kind of heard it wrong. She heard something different. Either way, what we have here is a man, man-made man religion, <clears throat> something that either Adam or Eve or together, they invented, and it was used by the enemy to find an opening. This is why we have to be careful, very careful, when anybody comes around us with a commandment that's not found in the Torah. Whenever someone comes and they add anything, but they can't prove it with the book, then throw it out. Uh, we are not called to religion, right? Religion is not what we're about. We're called to freedom, freedom to obey him, not to serve him however we want to, but to serve him without the yoke of man-made rules and regulations. So let's summarize what the enemy did. I just want to point out three things. I, I love you know simple points that everybody can get a hold of. Number one, the, the enemy, he got Eve talking. He did this by asking an open-ended question. He didn't open with, here, eat this fruit. Uh, that would not be very wise. So number one, he got her talking. Number two, he used what she said to undermine her position. See, she's the one that opened the door, and the enemy just walked right through it. Number three, he put doubt in her mind, and he offered her a solution to her problem. So I think these three, these three points are really crucial. Uh, now... What was the enemy's motive here? We're talking about motive, right? Eve bought into the lie because the serpent convinced her that God had a motive to hold Adam and Eve back from their full potential, okay? But what about the serpent, though? Was he trying to help Adam and Eve attain divine knowledge? Um, I just want to point out that, you know, sometimes knowledge isn't so great, uh, they were naked or naked, as my five-year-old likes to say, and they were perfectly fine with being naked, right? Uh, until they knew they were, and then they were ashamed. Our goal in this walk is not to figure everything out, okay? The Bible says that the whole duty of man is to fear Yah and keep his commandments. That is what we were put on this earth to do. I don't see anywhere where he instructed us that we had to have everything figured out, okay? Okay.
totally fascinating. A friend of mine I was just hanging out with told me a story about uh, some atheists, an atheist family that decided they wanted to come to God. Now, they did not attend any church. They op- they simply opened their Bibles and they started reading from the front of the book and doing what it says. Now, without any uh, help from man or man's knowledge, they became Torah observant because they were simply reading the Word and doing it. And now they keep the Sabbath and they study together with a group of people. No, no man-made religion involved, um, and that's where they landed. Now, Going back to the beginning here, Yeshua told us to be wise as a serpent. So I said that to, to ask this question. What is the difference between wisdom and knowledge? See, knowledge is the what, right? But wisdom is the how. Facts don't win debates. Facts don't convert people. It wasn't until the hearers were pricked in their hearts at Pentecost that they were then willing to do whatever Peter told them. So the truth of it is, if you can't get to the heart, then you are never going to convert anybody. The enemy happens to be rather talented in this regard, isn't he? Now, the question is, is this connected with Genesis 3? I believe it was. It is. In Genesis 3, 1, it says the serpent was crafty. Okay, what does that word crafty mean? Uh, Other words for crafty, some synonyms, you could say cunning or sly, calculating, and these all sound like really bad things. Do you think Yahweh wants his people to be crafty? Uh, The Hebrew word translated here as crafty occurs 11 times throughout the Hebrew Bible. Let's go to Proverbs 12, 16. I got four verses right quick. The vexation of a fool is known at once. But the prudent ignores an insult. Proverbs 12, 23. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools proclaims folly. Proverbs 14, 8. The wisdom of the prudent is to discern his way, but the folly of fools is deceiving. One more quick verse. Proverbs 14, 15. The simple believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. I bet you figured it out by now. The word is prudent. Now, if you look up the word prudent, you'll see some synonyms for prudent are wise, well-judged, shrewd, judicious, careful, cautious, discreet. These all sound like good things. But the same Hebrew word is translated as crafty in one place and prudent as another. So what's the difference? The difference is motive. Now, what's the enemy's goal? We read that he only comes to do what? To kill, steal, and destroy. So what did he do? He wanted to kill Adam and Eve by getting them to eat the fruit because he knew if they eat the fruit, they would die because Yahweh said so. He wanted to steal their innocence by making them sin, and he wanted to destroy their relationship with Yahweh. Now, this is where it gets fun because I'd like to show you where Yeshua used what appears to me to be a very similar approach, but with a different motive. Now let's go to Luke 10, uh, 25 and 26. It says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? Now, think about the situation in the garden with the serpent and Eve and compare this. Uh, Is that a yes or no question? Yeshua was asked a question. He responded with a question, with two questions, actually. And they were not yes or no questions. Yeshua did not attempt to shove something down this guy's throat. He also didn't answer his question. Why do you think he didn't just answer the guy's question? It was an easy question that he knew the answer to. The answer, I believe, is because in order for anything to actually take root in a person, it's got to come from within. One of my favorite movies, um, this this is related, one of my favorite movies is Inception. It's about this group of people that try to plant ideas uh, in people's minds while they're dreaming. Now, the challenge of doing this in the movie is if the person's subconscious, uh, they see that you are, you're preaching at them, you're trying to force an idea upon them, then their mind will actually attack you. Uh, if you've seen the movie, you know what I'm talking about. 
you, you don't need to watch it just for the point. <laughs> uh, as long as you as long as you talk to the person and you ask them questions in the dream, then you can kind of steer them toward the outcome you want them to get to without forcing it on them. But it has to be their idea in order for it to stick. I believe the motive determines the difference between manipulation and motivation. If you're trying to control somebody, that is wrong. If you're trying to encourage someone, then the method can be really similar, but the goal is totally different. It's like trying to teach someone to fish instead of giving them fish, okay? If you can if you can sell the idea to the person that it will be better for them so they can have fish whenever they want, then they'll gladly learn from you. But if they see that you're being mean and stingy and you don't want to share your fish, then they'll just gripe and complain and they'll refuse to help themselves. So teaching someone to fish is not manipulation. It's helping them to see from their perspective why it's better to be this way. Now, continuing on in verse 27. Uh, and he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You've answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, I love this. Yeshua gave this man a word of affirmation because he answered correctly. Uh, I do want to plug this little side note here. It's worth asking the question, if someone came to you and asked you, what shall you, what shall they do to inherit eternal life? Let me pull my scriptures back up here. Then uh, would you tell them to obey the law like Yeshua did, or would you give a different answer? Everyone appreciates words of encouragement. Think about this simple you know, this simple point, when your child gets an 80 on a test, 80%, how do you respond? You come back and say, wow, you know, you missed one out of every five questions. Maybe you'll do better next time, Tommy. You know, is that is that how you respond to your child when they get an 80? Or do you celebrate the victory? I mean, use some wisdom here. Encourage people that are moving in the right direction. We all know people who see the 20% missing instead of appreciating the 80% success. Don't be that guy, right? The man wanted to justify himself. So, so the guy in the, uh, in the Gospels here, he continued talking, and he asked the question, Who is my neighbor? Uh, Yeshua gave him the parable of the Good Samaritan, and he still didn't answer the man's question. Instead of answering, he asked him another question, as you read this for yourself, and then he confirmed his answer. So, how much more effective is this approach than the approach of pointing out someone's faults and then telling them what they should be doing? The question is, can we in the Torah community learn this lesson? So, I hope you got something out of this crafty connection. Thanks for watching.